Welcome to just one of Skillcap's famous class guides that are the most valuable resource available that actually help you improve in Arena. This is just one of many videos that are a part of a comprehensive course for how to play Arms Warrior like a pro. We spent hundreds of hours developing these courses with players that have spent thousands of hours perfecting their craft. This allows you to learn all the secrets and strategies of the world's best in just a matter of minutes. For everything you need to go from feeling hopeless in PvP to being the teammate everyone wants and actually start climbing, be sure to check out Skillcapped after this if you're serious about improving. Hey everyone and welcome. Here we will go fully in depth about how to play an arms warrior, going over all the damage aspects as well as setting up kills and winning games. First and foremost, an arms warrior needs to do great damage, period. Arms Warriors are built around having incredible sustained damage, both single target and multi-target. Learning how to deal optimal damage will dramatically help players that are struggling to do this correctly. So let's start off with how to properly deal single target sustained damage in Arena. Mortal Strike is your biggest priority for damage, being important to use as soon as possible as it has multiple effects happening with every press of the button. It puts up mortal wounds on your target, reducing all healing effects by 25%. It activates deep wounds, which applies your mastery, as well as having the potential to proc your mortal combo conduit. This means that targets affected by your deep wounds take more damage dependent on your mastery value. Using mortal strike off cooldown will keep these two debuffs up on your target, being essential to do at all times for more damage and reducing the enemy's healing throughput. Overpower deals an incredible amount of overall damage and has a number of added effects due to the spell's design, talent, and conduit choices. It's great single target pressure used after Mortal Strike is pressed. It also gains more value when cleaving due to Dreadnought. Be wary of Tactician procs as this will allow you to have more overpower uses, which will be important to use during the downtime of your Mortal Strike. This is because overpower buffs your Mortal Strike with each use, allowing you to constantly buff your next Mortal Strike and deal increased pressure. These two spells go hand in hand and will make up the majority of your passive pressure. Arms Warriors also have another proc-based damage in the form of Sudden Death. This procs randomly, which should be prioritized ideally after your mortal strikes. Executes in general are one of the biggest burst damage abilities a warrior can have, so using them in this manner will help increase your damage dramatically as well as help land kills massively. With or without Massacre, you want to look to execute when targets drop low in an attempt to finish them off. Bear in mind, it's more powerful against low armored classes, as well as dealing more damage depending on how much rage you have. Ideally, you want to have 40 rage for your executes when looking for kills. For those Venthyr warriors, Condemn works in the exact same priority as Execute, with the addition of being able to use it regularly on players above 80% health. Another spell that could come into play is Rend. Rend is taken specifically if you aren't Venthyr, and if you're against high armored targets, needing more pressure. You want to prioritize this after Mortal Strikes, keeping it up on 1-2 targets if doing multi-target damage. Lastly, for single target sustained damage, Slam can be used as a filler, albeit it's rarely used. It can be a nice way to min-max your pressure though if you have extra rage and all the other previously mentioned abilities are on cooldown and not available. Well, what we've already explained is a sure way to increase your damage, there's one key element that's missing here, which you wouldn't notice in a PvE environment and you guess what it is from watching this gameplay. That's right, the use of hamstring is a vital part to your normal rotation too. Keeping up hamstring is vital as it allows you to connect to your target most of the time. As such, you want to apply it before it falls off in most situations. It could also be used during the downtime of Mortal Strike and Overpower in order to keep maximum pressure as well. If hamstring falls off, there's a high chance the target will kite you, reducing your uptime on the target. Being out of melee range as an arms warrior means you deal zero damage to the enemy team, reducing your pressure dramatically. Even though it sounds ironic, in my opinion, your biggest priority for maximum sustained damage as a warrior will be your lowest hitting ability, hamstring. So keep up this snare when possible, using it over any damaging ability if it's about to fade on the target. Luckily, we do also have access to piercing howl when unable to get off hamstring. This can be used to help reach targets again, allowing you to reconnect with pressure and even get that hamstring back up. As for two target pressure, the only form of sustain here is through sweeping strikes, being excellent against two targets close together for big cleave pressure. A very common situation in which to gain value from sweeping strikes is when you're the target from an enemy melee player. 
This is simply because by going toward one of their partners, being a healer or a DPS, then you can easily use sweeping strikes when they follow you to build pressure on both of them. Remember that your primary target takes the full damage, whereas the target being hit by the strike takes 75% damage. So be sure to have the main target be the one that you're trying to kill. All right, that's everything on sustained damage. To recap, you want to firstly make sure that your target is snared. Then you prioritize Mortal Strike as your first damaging ability, Rend if you play with it, then Overpower, Execute or Condemn, and lastly Slam as a filler. Now that we've covered sustained damage, we can take a look at how to deal optimal burst damage. This requires the normal abilities for sustained damage as well as additional offensive cooldowns, being Warbreaker, Avatar, Bladestorm, and Spear of Bastion. Ideally, you'll have your basic debuffs up on the target. Having Hamstring recently refreshed means that you won't have to apply it during your burst window, which could be a DPS loss. You should aim to have 1-2 overpower charges ready for your next Mortal Strike for ideal burst damage on your Mortal Strike when you pop your offensive CDs. However, you shouldn't delay your pop for this as it isn't a necessity to doing big burst damage, but it can help increase it. Sharpened Blade could be used here for added burst, as well as reducing the healing reduction from the enemy team. If you're playing with Rend, then this will be another debuff you ideally want up before you burst, potentially benefiting from the 10% increased crit strike damage. Once all of your important debuffs are active, you want to activate one of your most powerful offensive cooldowns, being Warbreaker or Avatar. This is followed by your single target sustain rotation, which will add more damage due to the power of your offensive CDs. Warbreaker will be your most used and most powerful offensive CD, being useful in single target and AOE burst damage. Simply using it before you press your other damaging abilities is the best way to execute the burst of this ability. Again, for single target burst, you want your big mortal strike ready, using it after the Warbreaker, followed by your normal single target priority, being mortal strikes, overpowers, executes or condemns, and lastly slam fillers if you have no other cooldowns. Ideally, in this time, you want to achieve using your mortal strike off CD that you can fit in as many as possible while Warbreaker is up. In multi-target burst, Warbreaker can be used in the same way, trying to land it on as many targets as possible to spread the debuff. Then your rotation would change here, having the addition of using Spear of Bastion or Bladestorm here to deal incredible AoE burst pressure. The more important one here is Bladestorm, dealing incredible damage due to the spell design itself. This pairs excellently with Warbreaker if you want to have big pressure against two or more targets. It's also easy to use, simply use Bladestorm right after you use Warbreaker. Spear of Bastion is also another nice addition here to your AoE burst, helping you maximize it. Not only does it do quite a bit of extra damage, it will keep most classes locked in place, unable to spread away from Bladestorm, taking the full damage of it. This will allow you to deal your maximum AoE burst when used in this way. The problem with constantly using Bladestorm for burst pressure is that you won't be able to utilize it in other instances. Examples of this include uptime on targets or immuning CC on yourself. As such, you mainly want to use Bladestorm for compositions that rely on multi-target burst damage to win games around every one minute, such as TSG or Turbo. There are two times that you want to use Bladestorm for single target burst damage. The most common one is when playing with the Unhinged Legendary, giving you excellent burst in single target situations. It can also be excellent in two target situations, working in conjunction with Sweeping Strikes and even Sharpened Blade, giving you increased burst damage on both targets. Note that you still want to make sure that you have at least Warbreaker up when bursting in this fashion. The other time that you want to Bladestorm for single target burst damage is simply to immune CC on yourself delaying it and allowing you to get off big damage without the enemy being able to negate your pressure. Now, let's talk about Avatar a bit as this can be used on the same global paired up with Warbreaker, adding even more damage as well as being easy to use since it's off the GCD. You could use it all at once with your Warbreaker when you want to deal the most damage possible in both your single target and multi-target burst damage windows as explained before. Remember, we talked about how important it was to have uptime on a target in order to deal maximum pressure. As such, Avatar will typically be used as a root breaker against classes such as Mage, Druid, or Hunters in order to increase your uptime. In other situations, it can also be better to split up Warbreaker and Avatar to make it more difficult for the enemy team to deal with it in terms of using defensive CDs. Say for instance that you're fighting a Shaman, and the Shaman keeps trading Astral Shift for Avatar. While this is a good trade, you could also take advantage of this, knowing that he won't have a big self-defensive cooldown for your next Warbreaker. The same could happen with Warbreaker forcing defensive cooldowns or peeling abilities. 
If this happens, then later you could use Avatar or both of these cooldowns when the enemy doesn't have defensive CDs to survive them. You only want to use both at the same time when you want to force big defensive cooldowns or when you can't be peeled, such as during a blade storm in multi-target burst situations. All right, so that covers the burst cooldowns that you use, but there are a couple of things that will make them much more powerful. The biggest thing is by locking your target down, which you can do yourself with Stormbolt. You can either use Stormbolt first, then pop cooldowns or pop offensive CDs, then Stormbolt. Both work, but have different drawbacks. If you use Stormbolt first, then when you pop your cooldowns, you will have less globals free during the Stormbolt outside of using Warbreaker. If you use Stormbolt after Warbreaker, then this could be more risky as the enemy player could use a defensive CD or kite in between these globals, nullifying your burst pressure. As such, you'd prefer to use Stormbolt first or a partner stunning your target so that you can get your burst pressure off cleanly without the use of pre-defensive CDs. That being said, if you know you can get away with using Warbreaker first, being unable to be peeled during the global, or that the enemy team can't use a defensive CD in this time, then you can do this first for a bit more pressure. The second best way to lock down a target is with Spear of Bastion. This is a longer cooldown, but it can lock down multiple targets, allowing you to get off single target or burst AoE pressure easily. Using it in this way will be common against elusive targets like monks, mages, or druids, giving you uptime on them which could force big defensive CDs. Since it's a 1 minute damaging CD, it could be nice to use when Warbreaker is up, adding to your burst pressure and maximizing its damage. If you are using Bastion for more pressure, then make sure to use it after Warbreaker, creating more burst. The last thing that could warrant the use of popping your offensive CDs is when you get sudden death procs. Thanks to how powerful execute hits are, popping your offensive CDs when sudden death procs can deal an immense amount of single target pressure. This could also be used in conjunction with sweeping strikes, getting off a crazy amount of two target burst pressure, catching enemies by surprise. So to summarize the most effective way of bursting, you want to have your burst cooldowns ready, being Warbreaker or Avatar for single target, with the addition of Spear or Bladestorm in multi-target situations. You want to keep your debuffs up actively, refreshing Hamstring or Rend if they are about to fall off, as well as getting overpower stacks if available. Then as you pop your CDs, stun your target or lock them in place with Spear of Bastion. This could be done with your own Stormbolt or a partner's stun as well. Finally, you're ready to pop your offensive CDs and unleash your normal rotation, outside of defensive stance to deal much more damage. While landing all these steps isn't a necessity all the time, you want to get as many of these as possible to increase your chances of getting big burst damage off, especially against low armored targets where your damage is increased significantly. Being able to burst someone down in windows where you can could definitely be the difference in winning or losing a game. Alright, so you now know how to deal optimal sustained damage and execute your burst damage. So is there anything else to it? Well, there's quite a few extra tips that could help you min-max your damage output. Did you know that overpower works through dodge or parry mechanics at all times? As such, this can be excellent to use during times when you can't typically hit your enemy with other abilities and still want to pressure them. A common occurrence of this happening is specifically against Windwalker Monks. You can use overpower through their turbo fists, allowing you to keep up with pressure against them. For Venthyr Warriors, since your Condemn is magic damage, you can actually use it through Blessing of Protection to keep up damage. This can be a nice way to gain additional pressure, as well as catch Paladin teams off guard, sometimes killing targets through Bop due to the power of Condemn. Another basic tip, which doesn't really involve damage, is to time a Mortal Strike just after the Sharpened Blade debuff expires. This is because you cannot refresh Mortal Wounds while Sharpened Blade is up. So you want to ideally refresh Mortal Wounds just as Sharpened Blade fades so that you can always reduce incoming healing effects. Failing to do this against aware healers could time big healers during the downtime, allowing them to easily burst heal their partners before you can apply Mortal Strike again. So that covers the niche uses of damage, but what about the main ones? Well, there are three main tips to min-maxing your damage, which could be the difference between winning or losing a game if done well. The first is being out of defensive stance as much as possible. While being in defensive stance due to enemy players pressuring you, you can still look for opportunities to pop CDs and deal pressure even when stuck in defensive stance. This will be needed when being heavily trained. However, if you're not under heavy fire, you should try to always get out of defensive stance when popping offensive CDs to make them more impactful. Another good tip against setup-based comps is to check if you're on diminishing returns on stunts. 
Knowing that you're unable to be stunned for a while and not taking any pressure can be a sure way to head out of defensive stance, dealing more pressure knowing that you can't be stunned. As for more passive stages, as long as you're actively aware of the enemy's pressure and setups, you should be in a good position to know whether or not you need to be in defensive stance. Ideally, you'll be out of it as much as possible, only shifting into it if you're taking high damage or being trained. This alone can be one of the biggest reasons another warrior may outpressure you, if you're caught in defensive stance too much. A more simple yet highly effective one is to make sure Deep Wounds is on your target at all times. This is due to your mastery being activated by Deep Wounds, increasing the damage that you deal on targets affected by it depending on your mastery value. For the most part, this is an easy mechanic to keep up due to Mortal Strike, Warbreaker, and Bladestorm all refreshing the effect. However, sometimes you could be looking too hungry to land multiple executes, which no longer refreshes wounds. So make sure to have deep wounds up before hitting that execute button in order to maximize its burst damage. Moving on, some warrior spells or other classes can have nice interactions with an arms warrior in general. There is quite a bit of buff synergy with arms warriors providing battle shout. This is excellent when paired with any melee or hunter specs in general, giving them extra damage as well as yourself. Another buff which only monks can provide will be Mystic Touch. This is an excellent buff for warriors, giving quite a chunk of extra pressure. Make sure that your monk provides this quite actively though, as it has to be active via a debuff on your target. Outside of buff synergy, the only other spell that has good interactions with other classes is Spear of Bastion. It allows you and your partners to connect on a target that most likely can't kite out of line of sight or out of melee range. This not only makes it nice for casters to not have lining issues, but it can also make it easier for warrior melee cleaves to connect big damage on your target, which can easily net them kills or big defensive CDs. This makes it an important offensive cooldown in most melee cleave compositions. Awesome, now that we know all about the damage aspects of an arms warrior, let's look at another fundamental aspect of arenas, being the opening of the game. Generally speaking, most warriors typically charge in on the opener to gain extra rage, helping with pressure. However, this opener is not favorable for a warrior in certain situations. You want to hold on to charge to use it at more opportune moments. This is important against classes that can potentially kite you, such as demon hunters, where you want to save a charge when they use a mobility cooldown, allowing you to easily keep up with them. Another common example is in 2v2 arena games. If you want to make swaps or get onto a healer, you could save charge for them, using it to connect onto them without having to use Heroic Leap instead. An opener like this is good for the Warrior Druid, as now the enemy warrior has no charge for the Druid. Now the Warrior can also pursue pressure on both the Paladin and Warrior, gaining momentum with cleave pressure. Compare this to when you don't have charge for a healer, and you swap to them with a Heroic Leap. This allows the enemy healer to easily kite you if they have mobility cooldowns at the ready. That being said, there are two reasons that would warrant using charge in your opener. One reason is to delay enemy players from reaching your partners. If you know the enemy team want to gun down your partners, then charging them to instantly root and snare them will slow down their pursuit. This can slow down their pressure a tiny bit, but more importantly, they will usually have to use their mobility cooldowns in order to connect to your partner then. It may be a big deal where kiting is key to victory. Or, if that person is the target, they'll then not have their mobility to kite away, resulting in their demise. Secondly, charge can be used in the opener to have a better aggressive position for your team. This is more typical against casters where you want to keep them at bay, making it difficult for them to get in between you and your healer. A good example of this is against Shadow Priests, where you can make it slightly more difficult for them to run at your healer for CC, denying the use of fear on your healer for quite some time. They are also generally easy targets to maintain uptime on, so you won't need to worry about getting kited by this class too much if you put your charge on CD. Another key aspect of your opener is whether you want to be in defensive stance or not. In most cases, starting off in battle stance will be totally fine, being ready to swap into defensive stance when needed. Most enemy teams will find it hard to kill you instantly in battle stance as you will be at 100% HP. You will usually be swapping to defensive stance if they are pressuring you or if you're suspecting a setup on you. The times where you want to be in defensive stance is whenever there is a stealth enemy in the opposing team. If you're not in defensive stance, you can get caught out with heavy pressure early, which could mean that you have to use defensive CDs that could have been avoided. This comes into play against any mage, hunter, druid, or rogue team. It could look to stun you in the opener and slay you if you're not already in defensive stance. This will significantly reduce the likelihood of you dying in the opener unless they pop big offensive CDs. As we know, Arms Warriors are excellent deterrents against a lot of pressure in an arena game. 
in a lot of openers, it can be important to be ready with your peeling abilities if an enemy team makes a setup at the start of the game to negate their setup. This will potentially allow you to save the usage of other team defensive cooldowns and eliminating the chance of dying in the opener. Another good example of this is specifically against Rogue Mage in 2s or 3s. You will usually have to use multiple peeling abilities in order to deny them from having a strong opener against your team. One key aspect of being able to peel or have good defensive openers against stealth classes is by using Bladestorm in a timely manner. The best way of using this is to immune CC on yourself that you expect to come, allowing you to get off your peeling abilities and deny the opener from the enemy team. You can typically read this by looking at if one of your partners receives CC, in which case you can opt to use Bladestorm if you know the next global they will try to CC you. Timing this well can potentially snuff out a stealth class in this situation, enabling you to use some of your peeling tools as an arms warrior or deny their opening pressure. After these kind of openers, when you have to play defensively with peeling, you can look to be on the aggressive as soon as you survive the setup, pursuing pressure of your own. In nearly all cases, once you survive this opener from the enemy team, they will essentially run out of juice, allowing you to pressure them and start working on wearing down the enemy team. Next up, one difficult situation that many DPS players face themselves is how to deal damage while being trained. Luckily for arms warriors, you are naturally tanky, especially against enemy melee players. Most of the time, you can continue dealing your damage while being trained as long as you bear in mind a few things. The most important aspect about being trained is that your positioning is key, since you're essentially controlling the positioning of your enemy and your healer. For instance, in this example where I know the enemy warrior is tunneling me, I'm positioning on top of the enemy healer, forcing the warrior to charge me if he wants to stay on me. Now that this has happened, my healer has breathing room, being able to free cast at a safe range and not worry about being charged at, healing with more ease. The positioning becomes even more important against melee for two reasons. If a melee is on you and you spread away from your healer, then that melee will have difficult time landing interrupts or CC onto your healer. They would have to choose to either pressure you, allowing your healer to free cast, or they can go towards your healer for CC and interrupts, making them lack pressure on you. It will also make the game easier to read and allow you to take advantage of this. For instance, against this composition, I know that they have been making offensive setups on my healer, trying to position us close together in order to land their offensive setups and get a kill. So as he gets gripped in, I use my Overwatch Intervene to reflect the Hammer of Justice onto the Paladin and allow him to kite away, denying their setup. If we position poorly in this matchup, it would be much easier for them to get offensive setups that can easily cost us the game, being overwhelmed by their offensive CDs. One specific benefit with Arms Warrior while being trained is that you can abuse the power of sweeping strikes, simply getting onto a healer or another target of the enemy team while the melee is training you will allow you to easily get off sweeping strike hits, creating much more cleave pressure. This will commonly be used in 2v2 matchups, especially against other melee, which can be a guaranteed way to gain a pressure advantage. Sometimes you may have to swap targets when being trained. Make sure that you don't put yourself in a compromising position that could kill you or put your healer in a bad spot. Being trained by caster cleaves can be quite common in 3v3, being quite vulnerable to spell damage which can catch less experienced warriors off guard, making it more difficult to deal damage. There are generally two ways of dealing with this when you are looking to pressure them. Sometimes it can be best to tunnel one of the casters down most of the time. This will depend on the comp you play and play against, as this won't be the best synergy in most cases. You'll perform this strategy when you know that you can deal with the enemy comp by slaying one of the squishiest DPS casters and not have much of a downside when leaving the other free. However, most of the time it can be better and even easier to simply swap on the nearest caster to you and your teammates. Doing this will make your healer's life much easier as you're effectively going on the caster that is trying to position between you and your healer. By swapping to him, your healer can have an easier time healing you and the caster will have to choose to either push in, tanking more damage, or back into a more defensive position, unable to harass your healer. This also helps increase your damage as you can easily save mobility for kill attempts instead of trying to catch up to one specific target instead. By running to the nearest target, you'll spend less time being kited, thus dealing more damage overall when being trained by caster cleaves. Again, defensive stance usage will be key when being trained. You will need to be in this stance more so when being heavily trained with high constant pressure, diffusing quite a bit of damage on yourself. This will make you deal less pressure in theory, but survival is more key here, which again makes you do more damage. Remember, a dead DPS player does no damage, so make sure you don't die, allowing you to keep up the pressure. 
Next up, a new spell in Shadowlands that is ideal for being trained is Ignore Pain. This can help you deal more damage as you could opt to use Ignore Pain to reduce damage on yourself instead of going into defensive stance. So this way you can still deal your optimal sustained pressure while staying alive. Anyway, that's going to do it for this guide on how to play Warrior in Arena, maximizing your damage, staying alive, all that great stuff. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.